So this class is about American government and specifically uh, what your roles are here in the American government. That's the civics, your civic duty, how you are supposed to uh, be an active citizen, participate uh, in the government. What I like to do though is I like to go a bit further uh, back before uh, we talk about American government because uh, I think it's important to know the general history of government and it's not going to be a, an extensive uh, look at it, but you should definitely have a broad view of the history of governments uh, coming up because then it, it makes a lot more sense as to why we have the system we have uh, and it's also going to do a better job informing you about uh, why it is the way it is uh, in that we've tried many other models including no models uh, and we've gotten to the point that we've realized um, while completely imperfect still uh, are certainly imperfect still it is a drastic improvement than previous forms of government and, and have allowed people to uh, flourish and uh, it has also served to dis decrease suffering so we'll take a similar lens that we took for uh, economics as far as looking at uh, the various forms that appeared, maybe what their pros were, their cons were, and then what they were replaced by. Uh, did they go backwards or forward uh, as far as uh, effectiveness and progress uh, regarding uh, allowing for human flourishing and also decreasing human suffering uh, to get to the point that we're at. And then after uh, a few discussions of that, we'll talk specifically about the conditions for um, our, our colonial governments uh, and the transition to a, an independent uh, government under the United States uh, with our early Articles of Confederation and then the debates and issues that uh, allowed us to develop our modern U.S. Constitution and uh, how that has developed over time. And we'll also talk about some uh, historical and contemporary issues as well as specifically uh, how the actual government itself runs. Uh, but that's how we're going to start this. So uh, the first question for any government class becomes, uh, what is a government? What is a state? So what is a state? Uh, and by state, I don't mean like California, Nevada, like those are basically provinces uh, or regions within a government. Uh, a state, uh, as we're gonna at least talk about, is, is the more conventional sense. So a state is essentially uh, some sort of organization or institution or group, some group, uh, organization, or institution. Uh, that can do a couple things that can uh, mobilize resources so they effectively utilize tax income for example in, in modern states uh, to provide social services and infrastructure and uh, uh, military um, defense budgets and protection uh, police forces things like that uh, and they can mobilize those they can also issue out um, laws uh, and enforce those laws. They provide also uh, create laws and maintain order uh, to the point that, you know, we try to, at least in modern states, protect uh, people's individual rights and protect those from being violated by others. So uh, your stuff and your life and your freedom is your stuff, your life and your freedom, it can't be taken by somebody else unless you are found guilty of taking it from others. Uh, so that's kind of a modern state interpretation, but certainly creating rules and maintaining, or creating laws and maintaining order, that's been a traditional state view. You know, that, that definition has changed as to what laws are appropriate and whatnot, uh, but that's essentially one of the roles. Uh, another one too, uh, characterized uh, a while ago by historians and, and sociologists, is uh, what they call a, uh, they can monopolize violence. You're like, what does that mean? That means that the state, the government, is the only institution that has the authority uh, to use physical force and violence. So I can't just go, if I'm mad at somebody or I think that they've wronged me, go out and, and physically hurt them or kill them uh, or they me. It's illegal. The only ones that can actually use legally force, and there are of course in modern states parameters and limitations on that, the use of that force, but nonetheless, the only uh, legal body that can exercise force, be it using physical force uh, or, or taking life with like a death, death sentence, uh, or engaging in, in armed combat in, um, or in conflict in, in wars, uh, only the state has the authority to um, organize that uh, or, or carry it out. So that's the mean by monopolized violence. And um, that's probably a good set of definitions. I would say modern states would add a couple things. So I'll add some caveats. So these are specific to modern states. Uh, modern states also generally tend to look out for the welfare of their citizens. 
Uh, so we have social safety nets now. Uh, that's, that's definitely intermixing with the economics uh, because it's using tax income and, and redistributing wealth to a degree. Uh, but the, we are, in modern Western states, the, the, the government also has a role that, uh, it also plays a role in people's well-being. So if you are unemployed or disabled, um, uh, it will provide some sort of assistance or guidance. Uh, it, it maintains health standards and norms and provides health services. So those are just some basic things that um, the government does in modern states. And then, um, yeah, I think that's, that's good enough. That's a good, nice, vague picture uh, for these governments. And this is specific to modern states. Uh, but these uh, are pretty representative of uh, traditional ones. And there's some uh, different... Uh, characteristics of modern states that like we have constitutions limitations and things like that but uh, for the most part those are the general roles so that's kind of what a state is and it can take roughly three arguably four forms for the fourth is really just a lack of one but well, certainly three uh, there are uh, types of states or forms of state forms of states uh, there's going to be what we call monarchy which basically means one person is ruling so this can be uh, a king, an emperor, a queen. So we'll put a king slash queen, right? It could be an emperor too. If your kingdom expands and absorbs another, now you're an emperor. Um, king or a queen, uh, and it can also be a dictator, as we know it, dictator. So somebody who has, uh, through use of force or popularity, uh, acquired lawmaking power and, and, and executive power um, without, and a dictator implies it's just them. They're not answerable to somebody else. Uh, so Hitler is an example of a dictator. Stalin, uh, Mao Zedong, uh, you know, but there's a bunch throughout history. Uh, Mussolini, Francisco Franco, a lot of them are, are pretty extreme. Uh, Saddam Hussein, Fidel Castro, uh, arguably was a dictator. So uh, these are all people that have like absolute power uh, for themselves, not really answerable to others. Uh, and they are often characterized by um, generally rather brutal uh, regimes and rule. Uh, so there's monarchy, then there's also oligarchy, a little less common and a little more enigmatic, but certainly there are forms that have existed. This basically means like a group, a small group of people, generally powerful individuals, generally wealthy or influential, that sort of make all the decisions for everybody. They weren't necessarily, in fact, they usually weren't, aren't voted for. In fact, they aren't voted for. They just come to power through their own means, whether it's their own use of resources or force or threat of force, uh, and they dictate largely what goes on. So we've had quite a few of these. Uh, these would be more localized things like uh, city governments uh, or what, what are kind of like city states uh, or the feudal um, kingdoms and fiefdoms that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so these would be like nobles, for example, nobles, uh, whatever local elites there might be. So people that own property and peasants and aren't necessarily the kings themselves over all the land, but they work with the other uh, nobles or local elites to make decisions for everybody. Um, another example could be even certainly within cities, um, the uh, uh, wealthy uh, landowners could be part of those. I guess that's just a local elite though. Yeah, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, but the one I'd add to this though is uh, what we call one party states. Sometimes they might have their leader characterized as a dictator, but for example, communist China right now, which is run by a one party state, which is the Chinese Communist Party, they do have a president. Um, but, and they have had a president traditionally, but that president is sort of chosen uh, as, a, as a representative leader by a um, by party leader. So it's definitely a, a small, especially relative to the size of China, a small group or council that's the head of this party that picks their representative leader and makes those decisions. So that would be, uh, could be an example of an oligarchy or one party states. So again, in China, you there aren't any other legal optional parties. You have to be a member of the Chinese Communist Party and the, the people that are the head of that party are really the ones ruling the country. All right, then there's also democracy, which you're probably familiar with. And there's definitely some more variants or, or there's more nuances than what I'm gonna cover here. But uh, what I would say for democracy is there's either direct democracy where everybody has a vote, like we want a law, somebody proposes it and everybody in the state votes for it, yes or no, or whatever it might be. That's direct democracy. Uh, and you've also got representative democracy. And we actually technically have both, depending on the state here in the United States, but we are certainly a representative democracy at the top, which means we vote for people who go to Washington, D.C., in our case, and vote for laws. So we vote for the uh, several 
it depends on the country how many there are, but it could be England, uh, it could be Germany, it could be all kinds of states in the United States, but you basically vote for essentially a few hundred people to go uh, to uh, Parliament or Congress or, or, or the Reichstag, whatever your representative assembly is called historically, uh, and they make the laws by voting in that, that body. So the difference between uh, an oligarchy and a representative democracy is we choose them by voting. An oligarchy, people aren't choosing them. They, are, they choose themselves to their own uh, control of resources or power. Uh, that's kind of the difference. And one could argue that even these are too because you've got companies lobbying and uh, running campaigns that regular people can't compete with. And sure enough, but or fair enough, but uh, there is that option that anyone could run and be elected. And we do have those, those examples. Uh, and next, you could, I suppose, paint anarchy as a, a type of system. It's more about a lack of a state. So they generally don't want one group or person that has control of these features, uh, but there is some theoretical organization here. So this could be completely stateless, like no organization, no state, no organization. But most anarchists believe that uh, people should live in local federations or communes or unions, uh, and then they all kind of decide collectively to do something. So it'd be, it'd be some sort of mix uh, between, it wouldn't technically be a democracy though, because you wouldn't have to necessarily listen to whatever they decided to do, uh, but you're generally supposed to communally sort of decide what to do with, with, with a consensus and, and discussion. So I guess you could write uh, local communal uh, entities, but it's weird because uh, even those entities and the decisions they make in their in their their factories or towns or communes, they don't have any of these abilities. Uh, they are not going to be able to uh, technically arrest you or mobilize resources. They don't have a monopoly on violence. In fact, they don't believe in violence for the most part. Uh, so that would be uh, an anarchical or anarchist uh, type of style. So that's kind of what you're looking at, and you're going to have uh, different nuanced versions of these. Uh, but that's the basic four categories. Some would even say three, because again, this is kind of a lack of a state. But nonetheless, there's a there's a large minority of people that support this. Uh, starting with, you can even say arguing, argue, uh, well, certainly the anarchists of the 19th century um, started making this a political movement itself. And you've even got contemporaries that argue for it. You could go on the internet and find plenty. Uh, and there's even uh, I mean, Noam Chomsky is a uh, a prominent uh, and. Uh, famous psychologist, and I guess you could say philosopher, uh, who, is, uh, who endorses this and has a substantial following. So, uh, and it goes back to Mikhail Bakunin and, and earlier people. Uh, but yeah, so that's kind of what you're looking at as far as choices. Uh, and so the question sort of becomes, um, we haven't had always uh, a state, uh, so the, the question kind of becomes like, do we need one? So just to give it a super brief history on, on, on human existence, we've all been around as we know it as homo sapiens. Uh, modern homo sapiens with linguistic ability and the ability to sweat and throw projectiles and all that stuff uh, for about 200,000 years. And most of that time we were just under this category. We were definitely anarchists. There was no technical state for most of it. It was just kind of like local groups of, you know, anywhere from the low end, 30, 40, 50 people up to like 150 to 200 at max. Um, and you would go and move in these groups as hunter-gatherers and basically move with animals or with, that, with the seasons uh, and uh, try to survive off of the land uh, without any real knowledge of like how to practice agriculture and plant plants and things like that. So uh, we could write that as the Paleolithic era. That's not a perfect uh, marker because there's also, that means Old Stone Age and there's also a Middle Stone Age and a New Stone Age. Um, but uh, the Paleolithic, we, we, will, we will imperfectly say that that's basically the use of stone tools and hunter-gatherers that nomadically uh, roam the earth uh, to survive. That's the majority of our existence, by the way. That's, what percentage would that be? Oh, over 90% of our existence is dominated by this type of lifestyle. So that's uh, since about 200,000 years ago. Then that sort of began to slow down and end, not simultaneously across the world, but at different parts of the world at different times. People figured out how to plant plants, and uh, also they figured out how to uh, keep animals and coexist with uh, certain animals that we call domesticated animals, like uh, cows and sheep and pigs and things like that. Things that people raise to live off of their milk or eggs and then uh, slaughter and use their hides and bones and, and, and organs and meats and stuff to survive off of and make tools and whatnot. 
Uh, and those animals, it sounds terrible, but those animals actually benefited because um, humans, of course, provide them. Uh, I'm not talking about modern factory farms, of course, but uh, traditionally humans provided them with safety and food uh, from uh, um, competing wild species for the most part. Uh, and then uh, they got to lead arguably better lives than they would uh, if they were out, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Exposed to the difficulties of the wild. Uh, and then the humans got to benefit off as like a coexisting uh, benefit. And you've also got uh, domesticated animals that aren't necessarily uh, primarily for food like dogs and cats and things like that, depending on your region. Uh, but uh, that's kind of when this changes. And that's gonna be about 10,000 years ago. And uh, most people call that the uh, Neolithic Revolution. Uh, and that's about, again, depending on your uh, region in the world, uh, they, this starts occurring about 10,000 years ago or so. And we're talking super simple. It's basically what we call horticulture. Like, it's pretty much they just have gardens, like light gardens. It's not like they're mass expanding these farms and, and, and settling land and, you know, irrigating and building canals, that sort of stuff. That's, that's a little further up. Uh, so this is where they just figure out how to domesticate animals and move with animals and, 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 and can, Keep them safe while they can uh, use their milk and eggs and things like that uh, and then modern not even modern uh, just primitive farming uh, basically um, and that's beneficial for most humans and some animals uh, but when it really starts to change is when uh, we have you could say that this is when the first state systems began to exist but certainly at this next point um, when uh, we have the beginning of what we call river valley civilization. So this is like modern city-states. So the way I would phrase this is, I guess, not quite the Bronze Age, but we'll just say the Bronze Age, even though it precedes the Bronze Age. Now we'll say uh, city-states. Because this, when we start forming what are called uh, river valley civilizations, which basically means they figure out that you can grow food a lot better uh, in these fertile river valleys that have a uh, soil that's got uh, a lot of water access from the rivers, obviously, but also a lot of sediment that provides nutrients for, for growing crops uh, that they need, because you can't just put grow crops in any dirt. It has to have uh, certain uh, nitrates and other um, uh, minerals in there to uh, actually grow consistently. So they start figuring out these river valleys are great for that. So they start settling in those river valleys, whether it's in uh, the Andes region or Mesoamerica, uh, or it's in, what are some other ones, the Nile River, the Yellow River in China, the Yangtze River in China, the Indus River in India and Pakistan, uh, the Oxus River in, in, in Central Asia, uh, and others, Mesopotamia with the Tigris Euphrates. All these areas are where this sort of starts uh, because they have access uh, to these rivers. So that's gonna be roughly, the earliest ones are like in the early 3000s BC. So I'll say 6,000 years ago-ish. 6,000 to about 3,000 years ago or so. So that's about how long that goes on. Um, and that's where we actually have our first, I keep putting parentheses there. Uh, that's why where we actually have our first, certainly we know actual state systems where they begin to organize things. This is where when they settle in those river valleys, they actually start to do things like, oh, well let's dig canals and irrigate to uh, provide water, to use the soil to actually grow farmland. And, for the first time in this era, they're gonna have a surplus of goods, meaning they have more food than they need to live. So not everyone has to do farming. Now you can uh, do other things and trade uh, your other goods that you make for food. Uh, and we start having what um, certainly uh, historical uh, materialists like uh, Marxists and, and others would start saying, this is when things started to go awry because we had surpluses and then certain people would get a hold of those surpluses and use that as a way to uh, benefit themselves and, and control other people. Uh, and uh, not entirely wrong uh, when they say that. But this is when it starts getting more sophisticated. It's not just walk, walk around for food and maybe plant some food. It's like, no, not everyone needs to make food anymore. So we actually have surpluses of food. We have uh, uh, canals coming. We, people are actually organizing farms and, and land and territory. And now there's more people. So you gotta protect your surplus from other people that aren't a part of your uh, uh, state. So you actually like build fortifications and cities and walls and uh, hire soldiers and you try to develop better weapons to fight off or take stuff from other people. Uh, that's where it begins here in city states. <clears throat> and uh, that's gonna be a, I guess I would say there's no clear evidence to say that this was any less 
violent than these eras, which we'll talk about uh, in a bit. But that begins to change somewhat um, when we start getting to um, the classical era. In fact, I'm going to say, I'm going to extend this to when the classical era begins. So city-states slash Bronze Age and Iron Age. Uh, this is when those city-states begin utilizing and figuring out uh, metallurgy, figuring out how to make like bronze and iron tools eventually, so they, they get advantages over surrounding states and, and they start taking over their city-states and forming their first what we call empires, where one city gets so powerful that it takes over another city and then they now have twice as much stuff, theoretically, and they take over another one and they keep doing that until they get too big and, and then collapse on themselves and somebody else takes over. So I would say that goes from about 6,000 years ago-ish till about uh, 2,500 years ago. Not much of a difference there. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, that's what it is. And the difference here, and I'll even make another line here to really show that difference. It actually wiped that out, but oh well. Uh, is we're going to transition to what we call the uh, classical era because these were a bunch of local governments uh, competing for resources uh, and groups. And by the way, that, that has existed since the Paleolithic era too. Uh, if, you, if there was another group of humans in the area that you thought was a threat to your safety or resources, they were uh, extremely likely to use violence against them, which we'll talk about. Um, that was going on, but uh, one process that's going to change this, this is the beginning of what we call the classical era, or classical antiquity, I guess you could say, era, of uh, the Greek and Roman and Persia, uh, the Greek, Greek, Roman, and Persian civilizations, Persia being first, uh, the classical era. Uh, that's going to run from about, I'm going to start using the actual years here, uh, from about 550 BCE. So that's gonna be about 2,500 years ago till about 500 CE. So that goes, starting from 550, goes back down to zero and then back up to CE for common era or current era. Uh, what's gonna characterize these governments is what we call a centralized government. This means one city state has taken over a lot, but instead of just taking over their city state and demanding tribute payment or taking their resources, they go a step further, they say, all right, you are now a part of our state or city-state. Uh, so, you know, starting with Persia was the first one to really do this in a large scale, uh, followed then by the Greeks uh, with Alexander the Great and the Hellenistic Empire, then followed by Rome. Uh, it's going to be a, a model, uh, and also in China too, with the Qin Dynasty and the Han Dynasty. It's going to be a model uh, for conquering these other areas, but again, not just treating them like slaves or defeated peoples that you extract resources from. No, you actually begin to incorporate them into your state. So not just, we took over you to give us your stuff, it's we took over you, now you're part of us. So we're gonna uh, incorporate you into our government. Uh, we're going to not just take all of your power and give it all to ourselves. We're actually gonna say, all right, you are in charge of your area. And sure, you gotta report to us and, and, and listen to our laws, but you're actually part of us. We're, we're one, we're part of one state. Um, and that's gonna be a much better model uh, because it's gonna promote um, a lot more cooperation. Uh, and it's also going to, unintentionally uh, reduce certainly local warfare because now I'm way less likely to uh, rebel or fight against if I'm an equal uh, to you. You conquer me and then you incorporate me in your government. I become a government official and help distribute resources and have my own uh, forces and I can call for aid from you if there's a rebellion or I provide aid uh, for you if there's uh, some other foreign threat. Uh, people actually benefited from this uh, and they also benefited from having connections to other cities that were peaceful. So much less worry about trying to trade with a, a local city and being robbed on the roadway there or, or having the people just take my stuff when I get there because it's also part of my territory that has the same uh, laws and protections. All right, and that goes to about 500 CE, uh, certainly in Western civilization. Uh, and that's where I'm gonna actually focus. So we're going over the whole world here and I'm gonna start zooming in now uh, on Western civilization. So basically civilization is coming out of Europe and the reason why I'm doing that uh, it's not because I'm some Eurocentric uh, prick, but it's because uh, we're talking specifically about American government influence. And this is where Europe begins to diverge from the rest of the world, uh, is in this interim period after the fall of Rome. Uh, because we have the, the Middle Ages here, uh, and we'll call this the uh, era of uh, the, the feudal era. And that's a specific government type. It's actually going to be kind of a backward shift from a centralized government that has like one city instead of rulers that help rule uh, with local rulers across uh, a, a vast empire or state to uh, going back to kind of like these tiny city states uh, in Europe. And it's going to be uh, quite a mess in Europe for quite a while. 
And that's going to run from roughly, you could definitely argue, depending on your region in Europe, when this begins and ends. But we'll just say, to kind of encompass the whole thing, this goes from roughly speaking, uh, we could say 500 BCE till about, most people end at the Renaissance, but we're not going to go too in-depth in the Renaissance. Yeah. So this actually goes to about 1450. CE, but uh, it doesn't completely end. It still is going to trickle into uh, certainly the, uh, the 1800s in some areas. Uh, and in most states, actually, it's going to exist in some form all the way to the 1800s. But I wouldn't say you could characterize the 1800s as part of the feudal era. So what we're going to get into uh, modern states and, and re-centralization is uh, starting slowly. In fact, actually, we'll say 1450, just to be clear. Uh, or just to be, to make it easier, but just know that these feudal governments do continue in various forms uh, all the way until the 1800s uh, in Europe. But the shift begins here when we have a, an era of what you call the early modern era. In fact, I'll put that, early modern era. And this is where we start going back to the, uh, the, the kind of idea that made Rome and, and Persia and other groups so successful, we begin to re-centralize, and that's going to be from about 1450 CE till about mm, 17, we'll say 1750, but certainly some areas of Europe have centralized before then, uh, but some still haven't, so CE. And the key here is we're going to re-centralize. So we're going to uh, start um, forming governments that are, again, sort of ruled by one uh, body in like the capital, and then you have a bunch of local uh, rulers and governors that are gonna help uh, uh, regulate and administer uh, control over those other states. Uh, and then finally, we're gonna go into the, uh, what we call now the modern era, and that's where governments become a little more uh, complex as far as um, issuing in new ideas like constitutions and limitations, uh, and this is probably where most American government uh, classes are going to pick up, is in this modern era. Uh, and that's where we'll uh, all start cutting out some of the detail, because we're going to talk a lot about that throughout the year. But just know this is where, until about now, uh, this is where we start getting new ideas about government. Uh, and we start incorpor incorporating a lot more of these types of representative democracies instead of uh, monarchies and olig oligarchies. And the, the shift here becomes, again, more democratic, not that there were no democracies before. Uh, democracy uh, and a new idea, which was constitutionalism. So governments uh, actually made for the people that are uh, going to be limiting what they can do uh, to protect its citizens. Uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll kind of go from there after that. But that's kind of an overview pertaining to American government about how governments have uh, existed and changed sort of in eras uh, and, and then going onward. So the key ones I want to highlight here are, are Utilization of central governments, that's really made things better. Uh, and then their reintroduction later after a period of uh, sort of going, devolving back into local. And the big one, the one that we are currently uh, in and influenced by the most is the modern era, where we have a government that actually has specific limits and rules applied to it, which is a brand new concept. Um, while it did exist in, in various parts of the world, including England, to some degree, all the way back to the 1200s, most governments, the vast, vast, vast majority, uh, had no limits uh, on what they could do. There were some, of course, customs and things like that that they had applied, but if a monarch or an oligarchy wanted to do something that nowadays would seem uh, absolutely absurd, like having somebody imprisoned because they don't like them or because they uh, criticized them, uh, that, was, that was normal, that was, pot, that was uh, something that, that just occurred on a regular basis. All right, so now that we know now that we know essentially what those uh, early state developments were and what a state is, the question becomes, do we need a state? And that's going to sort of de depend, I guess you could say, on how you view human nature. Like, do we need this system, the state system, to keep us um, harmonious and, and, and lawful and in social order? Uh, or are humans actually better off without some sort of restricting, uh, coercive hierarchy where, where uh, somebody has uh, authority over us and can use mobilize resources and, and potentially use violence uh, to maintain uh, the laws and order.
So, uh, so do we need a state? Do we need a state? That's going to depend, actually, on um, whether you believe in uh, one of two of the more popular worldviews, uh, uh, or sorry, views of human nature. So you've got first, um, and these aren't the first guys to discuss this, but they're the first guys to really codify and establish a set view that other people uh, influenced and, and adopted, uh, was influenced and adopted by other people. So the first guy we have is Thomas Hobbes. He was around in the 1600s. He definitely uh, helped bring about our modern uh, governmental um, state with um, introducing the idea of a social contract, which is basically uh, the idea that we agree to be ruled by somebody or something and give them authority to, to maintain order because we can't do it ourselves. Uh, and then, of course, you've got Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, the Frenchman who came after uh, Hobbes. And these two have uh, two very different um, opinions about human nature. So I'll put that human nature. And uh, each is going to obviously argue one in support of states and one against having states at all. Human nature. All right, to Hobbes. Uh, humans were at the core, uh, not these like rational, trustworthy beings. And actually, we were at the core impulsive and irrational uh, and chaotic and potentially violent and aggressive uh, and that life without a state would leave us in a state of anarchy where we sort of have no uh, control and it's sort of every man against himself or sorry every man for himself uh, and where you've got to acquire your own goods and family and protect that from everybody else and you never know exactly who you can trust and uh, the only consequences would be any that you can carry out on somebody that's trying to act out against you uh, so to him Human nature is going to be irrational, uh, emotional. I don't mean just like being sad, but like being driven by emotions uh, and, and drives that might not be something we would consider uh, moral and good. Uh, emotional, uh, aggressive, and uh, life in a, in, a, in a society that doesn't have a, a state uh, would be uh, brutish and short. That's what Hobbes believed. Um, Rousseau, on the other hand, is going to believe the complete opposite. He's going to believe, actually, that human beings lived in a state of, I don't want to say utopia, but uh, greater happiness before there were state systems. That uh, when humans started thinking and using their, their, their brains to come up with new ways of doing things and making uh, logical improvements and using reason to explain and plan ahead and develop technologies, that at, that actually made us less happy because that made us see others as competitors and rivals. Uh, then we started developing these things like greed and lust, uh, and uh, we, we've sort of shifted our focus from living these wonderful, happy lives to uh, forming state systems that uh, control us and act in our self-interest, uh, that make us act greedy and, and, and lustful, etc. So he's going to say that human beings are uh, naturally simple and uh, harmonious uh, and altruistic for the most part, which means you know, when you're not self-centered, you'd rather help people than uh, uh, you know, just serve yourself. Uh, and that, uh, and that uh, society corrupts us, uh, makes us uh, greedy uh, or lustful or whatever it might be. Uh, and those are your two opposing worldviews at least on human nature and, and whether we not need a state. Um, so this is definitely the pro-state side, pro-state. And this is the anti-state side, or at least the way it's, it's planned out. Because actually both these guys are gonna argue that you should have some sort of agreement on how to run things, but they have two different opinions on how you should. By the way, this characterization of human nature was later uh, referred to as the view of the noble savage, uh, because, um, Rousseau claimed, uh, erroneously, that uh, the indigenous folk of the world were uncivilized and didn't have, uh, you know, things like language, even though they did, uh, and cultures, which they did. Uh, but they um, were, were, were somehow more in, in tune with nature and happier and not as concerned with the civilized, uh, frivolous lives, which uh, want education and material wealth and culture and uh, and, and, and are driven by those uh, motives. Um, so you've got the noble savage versus the uh, 
I guess say unnoble savage or brutish savage. Um, if you characterize that, brutish savage. By the way, savage just means uncivilized person. It's not like a, I know you're probably thinking of the Pocahontas uh, song or version of it, but it literally just means somebody who's not um, brought up in a, uh, a state system or state society. They're uh, in tune with, uh, or not in tune with, but they're, they're living a, a life of a, a hunter-gatherer, essentially, where you don't have this complex social apparatus with laws and things like that. So uh, those are the two competing worldviews, uh, and that's um, largely what's going to uh, dictate whether you agree with whether we need a state or not. However, I should mention that uh, history and psychology and centuries and centuries of archaeological evidence, uh, as well as data we have on violence and aggression, uh, favor, by a large margin, uh, Hobbes here. Uh, now, they were both kind of lobbing these guesses about as to what human uh, behavior was like. Hobbes was definitely influenced by the recent English Civil War he witnessed, when there were periods of somewhat anarchy and things got rather chaotic and violent, and he did not like what he saw. Uh, Rousseau um, didn't have as much of that to look, look uh, to, to oh, what's the word I'm looking for? He didn't have that so much to uh, um, um, taint or, or, or scar or uh, traumatize, that's the word I was looking for, traumatize his, his memory. He lived under the very stable uh, kingdom of France in the 18th century before the French Revolution. And while they were involved in foreign wars and they had their economic problems, for the most part, uh, they just had to obey uh, their king uh, and their um, uh, local nobility and live these uh, kind of controlled lives. I guess you could say certainly uh, Rousseau would uh, bent on education and uh, acquiring wealth and, and all of that. So uh, history absolutely favors this uh, side here. History and psychology uh, favor the Hobbesian view. Uh, that doesn't mean, by the way, that we have none of these characteristics, but um, if you were purely this or purely that, or you think we're purely those two things, you would be wrong. It's definitely a combination. But the fact that this does exist in us in some facet means this is not the only thing that exists, which means we definitely need a state. And we have lots of examples across history of, of at least moments in time where there is anarchy, where there is no government, whether it's rebellion or revolution or some sort of conquest or... Um, I don't know, some sort of disease or epidemic has spread, leaving us a sort of stateless society, uh, or our observations of non-state societies that exist in, um, with uncontacted peoples uh, in the um, Amazon rainforest or in Eastern and Central uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, as well as the Indonesian archipelago, which is the bunch of islands that's basically above Australia and, and, and between the, um, the Philippines and Southeast Asia. Um, there are lots of tribes that have not connected with what you would call civilized society or state systems. Um, so we have a lot of evidence for that. But it wasn't clear. This was actually the, uh, the favorite view up until about the 1980s or 90s. So I would say probably, um, from so history definitely favors this, but uh, from I would say probably the uh, early 1910s to about the 1980s and 90s, uh, this was the favorite view. Uh, particularly because this meant that uh, we were bad inherently um, and that um, it was kind of a biological explanation uh, for human behavior that uh, it's our behaviors and our abilities are programmed into us and people did not want to touch that thing with a 10-foot pole, the idea that uh, we could be born with certain traits we couldn't you know, get rid of uh, because we just had the whole uh, social Darwinist uh, holocaust um, um, Hitler fiasco. So everyone was afraid to touch that at all and say, oh, no, 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 we have no biological influences. The only thing that makes us bad is, is society. So that became a very, very popular set of views from about the 1910s or so, which is, of course, before Hitler, but this very social eugenics, racist theory, uh, uh, scientific view of, of, of biology and behavior was, was prominent. So afterwards, uh, certainly by the 1930s, I'd say the 1910s, uh, to the 1930s and onward between that and the 1980s and 90s, uh, it was very popular to say this is wrong because it says our biology uh, is involved in our behavior, and this is right because it says it's all about uh, our, our social uh, and cultural um, um, constraints and structures. So um, you had a lot of people that agreed with this. You had a lot of anthropologists 
uh, they're going to, in, in two ways, uh, uh, advocate Rousseau. They're going to um, suggest through observations of those uh, uncontacted peoples in the Amazon, uh, in East and Central Africa, and in Papua New Guinea, which is in Indonesia, or the Indonesian archipelago, uh, that observations of hunter-gatherers and horticultural groups, so non-state uh, systems that either hunter-gatherers or a combination of hunter-gatherers and like primitive gardening, uh, as well as archaeological evidence uh, of uh, past hunter-gatherers and, and pre-state societies of pre-states. Uh, they both suggest that we are um, largely non-aggressive, largely peaceful, and largely happy and harmonious living these wonderful lives. Uh, and they also uh, made other observations uh, based on culture uh, to support this. We're not driven by biological motives. We're purely driven by cultural motives. So if this was true, you should be able to look across the world at all the cultures of all the non-state societies, uh, all of the societies, uh, whether they're civilized or not, in North America, South America, Asia, Africa, Oceania, all these places, and they did. They cataloged hundreds of cultures, uh, and their overall reports for a few decades were basically, our observations and evidence suggest that there's low or no violence, and, and it's rather equal among people, and that uh, cultures vary so wildly that there's no uh, inherent um, behaviors that, that humans inherit uh, together, so there's no need to try to protect us with a state, basically. Uh, and that was what the dominant theory was. But it turns out that starting about the 1980s and 90s, uh, till, till now, uh, it flipped. It was discovered, again, mostly coming from anthropologists, but also historians. I should say historians, too. Historians were slightly less guilty of this, but certainly still guilty. You could say psychologists, too, but we're sticking to anthropologists. They're going to discover that... Um, these were incorrect, unfortunately. Uh, unfortunately, it turns out all of these were incorrect for several reasons. Number one, uh, this observation uh, data that indicated that looking at these modern or contemporary um, non-state societies that haven't contacted uh, the civilized or developed world, that live in hunter-gatherer and horticultural groups in the, in the uh, rainforests of the Amazon, uh, on the plains of, of, of East and Central Africa and the rainforest there and the Indian Archipelago, that uh, the observers um, failed in three counts. Either their research was perfunctory, which means it was just done um, too hastily uh, or not well enough. They didn't log the data well enough or they didn't look at the data well enough. Uh, or they didn't observe people for a long enough time, uh, which means like basically if they only go out and look at a tribe for a few months or weeks or a year or two, uh, and they don't notice any abnormal violence levels, they might go back and think there's no violence, and then a, a, a war or violent uh, occurrence happens that they didn't see uh, just because they didn't stay long enough. And you can see that today, too. If you, if you dropped in on Europe uh, in the 1920s uh, and throughout most of the 1930s, you'd be like, look, war, Europe has no wars. All it has is a few issues uh, you know, uh, regarding um, domestic issues. Uh, we had a couple of civil war type scenarios and coups, but there was no major warfare uh, and violence was relatively uh, peaceful. But if you had come in 10 years earlier and saw one World War I or 10 years later and saw World War II, you'd have a totally different opinion about that. Uh, so they found that uh, some people just did not observe for long enough or they didn't do a good enough job analyzing or collecting the data, or in some cases they outright lied about the data to try to protect this narrative that we don't need um, society to... To, to make us better off. Uh, and it actually turns out that these modern observations, observations, I should note, by the way, there was one, there's one exception, there was one, maybe there's two actually, uh, that had violent rates that were lower than this, uh, almost nothing. Um, but the odds of, uh, for example, uh, that you as a male would die uh, of a, a violent death from, from warfare or, or some sort of attack or, or raid, uh, were actually uh, that in these cultures, you have a 10 to 60% chance of, of dying a violent death. So that could mean some tribal war or some tribal raid or some feud within your tribe, whatever it might be. Uh, and those are astounding because you're, the odds of that happening to you now in a developed country are less than 1% by a large margin. In fact, if you take the whole 20th century and you look at United States and Great Britain um, and you include the world wars and the Cold War and all that in it, uh, the, uh, the, the, per, the, per, 
the percentage uh, likelihood of you dying from that uh, was I think less than 3%, and that's with all the millions of deaths. Um, and yes, the millions of deaths are awful and um, a, a very high number, but compared to the actual population, they're a very, very small percentage. Uh, so even though these numbers will be lower, like less people die in these uh, um, uh, cultures, there's way less people too. Uh, so um, even though there's less total deaths, the percentage and probability you'll die a violent death are much higher. Uh, they also found a lot of archeological evidence that was um, um, either uh, found to be hidden, uh, but mostly it just found new sites, archeological findings uh, of some mass violence, findings of hunter-gatherer mass violence. Uh, basically, what they found was uh, several locations where uh, an entire uh, tribe uh, of hunter-gatherers would be wiped out. Women, children, etc. all died from blunt force trauma for some sort of ambush or war or conflict. And it's not like they just attacked the males and went along, they killed, they wiped out the whole thing. Um, so what they've suggested based on observations from contemporary hunter-gatherer societies and horticultural societies, as well as archaeological findings, is inevitably these uh, organizations fight for several reasons. Number one, competition for resources, um, because they're, they're afraid that they'll run out in their area and they would rather live than uh, this other group that's in the area they don't know about. Uh, preemptive strikes, so being fearful that the other group is going to do that to you, so you strike them first. But also intergroup, um, there's uh, vendetta killings, um, revenge killings, so like uh, you don't like a person, so then you end up, you are, are likely, more likely anyway than nowadays to go out and try to kill them. Uh, and if that happens or anything re resembling that happens, the odds that the opposing group or family will try to exact revenge by killing on your side, uh, whether it's your family or you or whatever, are extremely high. Uh, and the reason is, if you don't do that, then you look weak. So you have to respond with, with violence or killing. So you have this endless cycle of killing. Uh, they've also found that humans go on raids, uh, and whenever possible, they, they kill members of opposing tribes uh, or wipe them out if the opportunity presents itself. Um, and that um, it just seems to be an unfortunate part of um, uh, many people's nature. And they found out that they're not egalitarian either uh, because the treatment uh, isn't equal. So uh, violent males, for example, in these societies are more likely to be reproductively successful. So not only can they take the things that, of the victims that they kill, but they actually take other things too, like their kids uh, or their wives. Uh, so you have some tribes, uh, particularly the violent ones, the more violent ones, because some tribes are more violent than others. Um, they actually find that they're rewarded for that because they, they, uh, they have instances of, of, of violent uh, guys having eight, nine, 10, 11 wives, um, either by choice, but mostly by uh, killing rival groups or husbands and, and just taking the wives as their own. Uh, so <clears throat> it's unfortunate. And again, that doesn't mean that every single person, every single tribe always does this, but the odds are much, much higher based on the, uh, the, the, the range of data we have that'll happen in a pre-state society than compared to now. Because now, if you go out and try to do those things, you might get away with it, but um, the odds that you'll be caught and punished for that are extremely high uh, by the state, uh, not by the other opposing party. So we have, it happens a lot less. Also, since we've organized our resources um, and created these systems that function economically, we don't have to worry about fighting for resources, uh, anything like we would if it was back in the hunter-gatherer days. Lastly, even though they found that cultures did vary as far as like, you know, one culture might, uh, uh, it'd be Confucian or uh, shamanistic or animistic or, or, you know, monotheistic like Jewish people or Judaism or Christianity or Islam. Um, people initially took those all as differences. Like, look, their religions are way different. Oh, look, their marriage um, uh, uh, um, practices are way different. Or, oh, look, their education is way different. Or their storytelling is way different. Uh, and they are. And their clothing is way different. And the, and the, the things that they uh, draw and create artwork is different. It's right, and, and basically say, um, these anthropologists and the data they've collected, it's like, yes, uh, the tastes uh, and details of all those events are uh, different across all cultures, but they're all the same thing. Uh, all cultures, for the most part, have religious beliefs. All cultures believe uh, generally in an afterlife. All cultures generally believe in some form of sacrifice uh, uh, or, or um, uh, set of actions that improves the odds for your society or the afterlife. They all have some sort of monogamy that's enforced. And I don't mean by the way, although sometimes this is the case, that they force a, a guy and a girl to be married, but uh, they often do uh, make it hard 
uh, whether the marriage was arranged or by choice, for them to split up. Either they make it difficult as far as being illegal uh, or make the legal process long and, and difficult, or they make it some sort of like a, a taboo thing where basically if you end up getting divorced, nobody's going to want to marry you again sort of thing. Um, they also have uh, uh, taboos regarding food. The foods are different, but certain foods are always banned uh, or considered um, uh, dirty or unclean. So even though the, the details of these practices might be different, uh, there is over, I think there's 500... Uh, or maybe it's 200, I'll say 200 to be safe, but I think it's actually 500. But I'll say there's 200 plus, I think it's 500, maybe 500, uh, common cultural uh, themes. And that's in all cultures across the world, um, which is a good indication that we've got some uh, mechanisms that we all inherit biologically as humans that predispose us to want these things uh, because every culture has them. And the details do vary, but... Uh, these practices are universal. Uh, in fact, those are called human universals, that list. So, the evidence overwhelmingly uh, is backing Hobbes. And also, what also backs Hobbes is the fact that uh, as time has developed and as those governments that we talked about before uh, became more and more centralized and eventually to the modern state, um, violence has decreased in general. It's, of course, snaked with spikes of, of, of increasing. Warf warfare has also uh, decreased, especially in the last two or 300 years since the Enlightenment. Uh, violence has decreased, uh, whereas production uh, and uh, lifespans have gone up. Um, so state systems, particularly those um, modeled after the Enlightenment, have drastically improved uh, the conditions for human beings going across. So as a result, history and psychology uh, definitely are favoring the Hobbesian view, but let's not think that these qualities aren't also at least partially inherent in human beings. I think the issue, though, is since you do have both, you have to uh, um, hedge your bets or create a system that prevents the, the negative aspects here uh, from manifesting in the form of violence or theft or disorder um, uh, that's going to be damaging to one's existence. So that's kind of the idea. It does seem we do need to state... Um, uh, it, and it does get easier, I suppose, to, to manage people in small amounts, especially if they're related, you know, uh, close friends or family, uh, kinship essentially. But uh, we're, we're way beyond that and have been for a long time as far as population goes. So generally speaking, it's more beneficial to have a, a, a state system. Um, even the bad ones, uh, no, I won't say even the bad ones, but uh, even some of the bad ones uh, were better than no state at all. Uh, and we do have pretty good models for states now. Um, so, having said that, um, the theme here is, uh, it looks like we do need a state, uh, but do you know, as we've gone across, um, across time, since the Neolithic Revolution 10,000 years ago, uh, through all the various uh, phases of government development, when we then got to uh, um, city-states, which of course were uh, uh, not the best as far as law and order went, we were still developing states, and then classical states that centralized, uh, centralized, uh, these would be localized. Um, and we do have, of course, a couple uh, blips backwards with the, uh, the, the feudal era, uh, at least in Europe, because we're focusing again on, on Europe because we're talking about American government. Um, uh, the feudal system, of course, was a bit of a step back. Uh, but once they rebounded and went back to a, a centralized uh, format and then modern governments that have uh, protections and limitations like constitutions and rules, um, we've uh, also improved um, uh, human, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Human flourishing. So things that uh, we would all consider are uh, good, good signs. So better life expectancy, less death from violence, less death from disease, uh, higher quality life. Uh, longer lifespans, that sort of thing, um, growing. And then we've also decreased uh, human suffering substantially, especially since uh, modern states that are largely modeled, at least in England and the United States, and after the 20th century or the early 20th century, once the fascist regimes and communist regimes, regimes crumbled, um, have spread beyond just uh, England and uh, the United States and uh, the Western democracies. Uh, now, to encompass much more of Europe, uh, Australia, South America, uh, increasingly Latin America, like with Chile, um, you've got Japan, um, even China has adopted a lot of Western economic policies, South Korea, 
Uh, there's, there's, there's a bunch that have caught up quite quickly. Um, and we actually had some really early evidence of this because even during this classical era and going forward, um, we had some uh, eras referred to as Pacts periods, uh, where, where there's Pax Romana or Pax Mongolica. In fact, I'll actually list them all. Uh, this applies to many, many empires that go from this classical state point onward, including, I'll, probably, I'll, I'll put them in order here, chronological order. This isn't all of them, though, by the way. Uh, beginning with Persia here, in the, the classical state era, uh, Rome, the dynasties of China, with the Qin and Han, and then going on into the uh, post-classical era with the Su, Tang, and Song dynasties uh, in China. What else we got here? India has got a couple Pax periods in the classical era, like the Mughal Empire, or sorry, the Mughal Empire, the uh, um, Mauryan Empire, the Gupta Empire, and then the Mughal Empire later on uh, in the uh, early modern era uh, has had several Pax periods. We've got, who else we got? The Khazar Cognate, which probably none of you have heard of, um, as well as the, um, uh, although I'm going, no, I'm going, I'm going to order, uh, the Mongols. Both of these, of course, are uh, pastoral communities, uh, which are um, essentially just communities that uh, have livestock and, and have them feed on the grass and move around with their livestock. Um, these two uh, um, um, types of, of, of these two civilizations also had periods of conquest where they united large regions and it was relatively peaceful uh, compared to not having a centralized state. Who else we got? Uh, Spain, Britain, uh, and the uh, post-war, First World War II, by the way, uh, world. Uh, have all experienced periods where uh, one government was able to, uh, by force or diplomacy, but mostly by force, uh, conquer areas and incorporate them to a centralized empire, and they would experience these things called Pax periods or eras of um, political, economic, and social uh, stability. So you had relatively uh, low amounts of warfare, uh, of strife, crime would drop, uh, economic activity would, would, would increase, these are all generally periods where the arts did really well because people weren't worried about, you know, dying from, uh, from, from, from slavers or rival states and they could focus more on their economic practices um, and religious practices and, and develop these ideas and educate themselves. And uh, I do want to qualify, though, because I know people are like, ah, oh, what about colonialism and imperialism? They were all imperial, except for this post-World War II world. That's the Cold War. It's a little more complicated. But certainly Britain backwards, uh, all of them are guilty of what's called imperialism. Uh, where they go out and, of course, conquer by force other states and ethnic groups. Uh, and in all of these cases, they're going to also practice slavery because every single civilization um, uh, up until the 1800s, starting in Great Britain and then spreading throughout Europe and the United States uh, and then elsewhere beyond that, um, all had slavery uh, until um, uh, Britain started getting rid of it in 1807 and then 1833. And then other Europeans followed suit and the Americans uh, through force, as we know, with the Civil War. But uh, I want to I mention that they are all absolutely imperial. They conquered the people by force. They are all absolutely um, uh, guilty of practicing slavery, uh, of having uh, limitations within their states based on uh, gender and sexual orientation uh, and, and class limitations and caste systems. Uh, so those are absolutely characteristic of all of these at one point. Uh, it doesn't quite apply as much to the British Empire with the caste system portion, but they definitely, through part of their uh, empire, certainly in the 1600s and 1700s, uh, uh, colonized people, imperialized them, uh, practiced slavery, and even by the, the 1800s, even though they get rid of slavery, they still are uh, conquering people uh, through diplomacy and by force as well. So yes, imperial powers, absolutely. All of them practiced slavery, uh, absolutely. Uh, some of them uh, practiced caste systems that limited you based on your birth or, or gender or whatever it might be, uh, and those are terrible things. But those are historical things, and those were historical norms. Um, and if you look at those areas, even with those terrible practices going on, uh, the um, political, economic, and social stability was much better than when these states didn't jointly uh, control these large areas. Uh, so warfare, violence decreased, and generally speaking, uh, economic uh, and social uh, affluence and education arts uh, tended to flourish in these these Pax periods. They're usually called golden ages too, by the way, uh, because of that uh, order and lack of chaos that was going on. So that's that, and on the next one, uh, we'll talk more about, uh, specifically, um, about uh, the role of religion in these states, 
uh, the state structures of feudal Europe uh, as sort of a precursor to um, uh, developing the, uh, the Enlightenment, which was a major, major, major uh, ideological or had a major ideological impact on uh, the formation of the, uh, the U.S. government and the, and the fact that we even uh, revolted against our uh, uh, British uh, colonial, um, um, I don't want to say masters, they're British citizens, but the crown, the British crown uh, going forward. So that's that, and we'll pick up uh, tomorrow with the next one.